Yes, indeedy, folks. It's the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Let's drive Moab. In the spring of 2007, I went for a little drive down to Moab, Utah. In previous shows, we have gone down Highway 6 and seen the train that goes through Helper and Price. As we were going into Moab, we found a mysterious little road called 279 and went down to Potash, going down the Colorado River. A beautiful drive. At Potash, we found a mysterious little dirt road that we decided not to drive. The next day we were headed to Canyonlands National Park after visiting Dead Horse Point and we saw the other end of that mysterious little dirt road. Which means that last week when I was promising everyone we'd visit Canyonlands National Park, we ended up looking into this highway called Schaefer Road instead. So, let's get back on our tour of the Canyonlands, okay? As we saw last week, before we were so rudely interrupted by our thinking of Schaefer Road, State Highway 313 goes over a little knoll and along a long flat stretch, which you get used to out here in Utah, before entering Canyonlands National Park, 32 miles from Moab. Entering Canyonlands National Park includes a pleasant visitor center, and just past that visitor center is this interesting bit of um, geological fact. Where you see the two guardrails there, the canyon comes up to this narrow little spot, and this narrow little spot is called the Neck. It's a feature similar to Dead Horse Point, where they built the corral that kept the Mustangs in. At the Neck, there is this interpretive sign telling you about the Neck, and how it opens up out to a flat area called Gray's Pasture and the Island in the Sky. Island in the Sky is a long piece of land that runs between the Green River on the west and the Colorado River on the south and a little bit to the east. From the neck, you go through a large field, very flat, called Gray's Pasture, and then out to the, where the road branches, and you go either south or north on the island in the sky. Before we go driving on Gray's Pasture and Island in the Sky, let's look at the neck and think about this feature in comparison to Dead Horse Point. Like Dead Horse Point, this small feature opens up to a larger uh, plateau, a mesa that is up sticking in the air above the canyon land. However, Dead Horse Point is not nearly as large as Gray's Pasture and Island in the Sky. Greg Dead Horse Point would be something similar to the size of this red dot. You may remember that out on Dead Horse Point, I had the definite feeling that the thing might just topple over at some point and down into the canyon, especially if there were a feat something like an earthquake or a strong wind. The large land masses of Gray's Pasture and Island in the Sky made it so that I felt perfectly safe in either such event. Certainly a wind would not knock it over and an earthquake would probably just shake it around a little bit but Gray's Pasture and the island in the sky would remain underneath me and my car. From this interpretive sign at uh, the neck is where we were looking down in the canyon last week in order to look at Schaefer Road coming up from down in the canyon. And this is another shot taken from where the interpretive sign for the neck is. This is looking out to the south and to the east.
And now let's drive across the neck and out onto Gray's pasture. After turning south at Island in the Sky, we come to Candlestick Tower Overlook, overlooking the Green River. After all those straight roads, you have to make sure you don't drive over the edge of the cliff? Well, yeah, that's right. These shots are to the east and a little bit to the south from Buck Canyon Overlook. And here are some views of Buck Canyon. When we get to the far end of Island in the Sky, the southern tip of it, we come to Grand View Point. Grand View Point overlooks the country where the Colorado River and the Green River join together. From up here on the canyon, you cannot see the junction of the two rivers, but you can certainly see the countryside through which they're flowing. There is a little rock kern you can take the lovely steps up to.
and there is this sign talking about the three different environments that we're dealing with. It also talks about the white rock, a layer of very hard rock that creates a second plateau. This white rock plateau at this point on Island and Sky is 1,400 feet below where we stand on the mesa and it is 1,000 feet above the river. And there are lots of excellent examples of the white rim sticking up out of the desert. There are many examples where the land comes sloping into the canyon and you can see where once the rains happen, the only thing that protects the sand, basically that sand, uh, from being washed away is this solid white rock. Driving away from Grandview Point, we ran into one of the residents of the neighborhood. And we went and enjoyed the Green River Overlook. At the Green River Overlook, there is this monument to John Wesley Powell. John Wesley Powell was a geologist who was fascinated by what he was studying to the point where he would go off on grand adventures. In 1857, he had rowed the entire length of the Ohio River. When war broke out between the states, he joined the Union Army and he lost his right arm at Pittsburgh Landing. By 1869, he had become fascinated with the Colorado Canyon, which had not been explored. So on May 24th, 1869, he set out with nine other men in four wooden boats to float down the Green River and the Colorado River into uncertainty. When Lewis and Clark had navigated up the Missouri and down the Columbia, they had Native Americans telling them that there was a big rapid coming up here, you might want to think about fording around that. Or if there had been something like uh, the falls in the Yellowstone National Park, they would have known about that by the Indians having reported it. However, there was nobody living in the Grand Canyon or in the canyons of the Green River. So Powell and his party had to just kind of listen and hope that they got off the river before something too major came up. They were cautious, of course, and they did ford many, many points on the river. However, sometimes they just had to plow through because the, there was no place on the sides of the river in order to uh, ford around a rapid. The party set out with four wooden boats and nine inexperienced oarsmen along with Powell to go shoot the rapids. They left from Green River, Wyoming, went all the way down the Green River, by the time they reached this point down in Utah, one of their boats had been smashed and they were running low on provisions. At two different times, men came to him and said that they thought this was complete folly and they left the expedition. When the party had left Green River, Wyoming on May 24, 1869, 
They were setting out in a high water river with four little puny wooden boats. The town people gave them a great send off, many of them probably thinking that these were 10 men off on a voyage of folly and surely never to be heard from again. After three months, five men in two boats came to where the Virgin River joins the Colorado River in Nevada. This spot is just a few miles upstream from what is now Las Vegas and is now under Lake Mead. And there they met some white settlers fishing. That was the end of their journey. A thousand miles, three months, and a whole nation that had assumed they were dead. And sitting here at the Green River Overlook ends this week's Drive Moab. Next week we'll go take a look at Upheaval Dome, a very interesting structure that has geologists arguing about how it was created. From Upheaval Dome we will then check out Mesa Arch, a very beautiful little arch that is just uh, literally carved out of the side of the cliff. We'll take a little bit more of a look at that beautiful Highway 313. And if we get back to Moab in time, perhaps we'll stop at a very amusing little restaurant and reward ourselves with a delicious dinner. Signs of Our Time Another cranky look at the fact that it's all going to heck in a handbasket. And after all, what more proof do you need? Why, if free pool and beautiful women don't keep you open, I think that things are worse than we think. And this has been another episode of Signs of Our Times. Proof positive, it's all going to heck in a handbasket. And now, wow! I didn't know that. Today on WOW, I didn't know that, let's take a look at some of our most fascinating brothers and sisters, the Beatles. I was walking in the hills one day, and a child had come up across a beetle walking across the path. The child asked what it was, and the child's mother responded with, Ew, it's a bug. We don't want to look at that or touch it. Well, I suppose there is some wisdom to getting your children not to pick up every little thing they see. However, if we get to looking at beetles, we will find that they are some of the most fascinating creatures around. And, as we shall see, they are instrumental in giving us very basic religious concepts that we carry with us to this day. What we commonly call beetles are actually a very large order of insects. Indeed, a full 40% of all insect species are one form or another of beetles. The order of beetles has more species than any other order in the entire animal kingdom. At this time, 
there are more than 350,000 species of beetles and we're finding more every day. Out of those more than 350,000 species, there are tens of thousands of those species that fall into the categories that we call dung beetles. Dung beetles, as the name implies, eat and or raise their children in dung. They prefer herbivores or the dung, the cow pies from animals that eat herbs and plants, but they'll get along with the dung from animals that eat meat if they must and if they're the right species. Dung beetles are divided into three groups. There are the rollers who create little balls out of the dung and then they roll them with their hind feet to wherever they want to uh, put them away to keep them safe. Rollers quite often have their dung stolen from them by other beetles. So they, you'll see them scurrying right along with their little rolled up balls of dung. They take these balls of dung to their chambers, either to be used as food or for brooding their young. Other dung beetles are called tunnelers. They will take the, the dung wherever they find it and just bury it right there. And other dung beetles are known as dwellers. They do not roll the dung they get, nor do they bury it. They simply live in the manure. So we have rollers, tunnelers, and dwellers, all doing us a world of favor. These small animals that theoretically would be considered by some perhaps the lowest of the beetles because they live and are born in dung, actually are some of the most important creatures in their relationship to humans. Throughout history, removing the dung from our herds has kept our herds safe from diseases and from having to wallow in their own mess. It is estimated that in today's U.S. livestock industry, dung beetles save the industry $380 million annually by taking care of the pies that are left by our industry. But the lowly dung beetle has done much more than just take care of our animal's pies. It has indeed carried the concept of resurrection. In ancient Egypt, of course, the Nile River would flood every year. Everywhere that you had been working, all of your land would just be covered with water for an extended period of time. Then, as the water started to recede and go back from the shore, the high mounds that had been left out in the middle of the river would start to appear. Some of those mounds would be from last year, and some of them would be from new silt deposited this year. However, there was something very odd. Everything had been washed away, and the mounds were still way, way out there in the river. Nobody had swum over to them. No animals had swum over to them. Certainly no little tiny beetles had made it all the way over to those little mounds of dirt. And yet, out of the middle of nowhere, out there on those bare mounds of dirt, would appear dung beetles. It was a miracle. Life coming from nothing. Life appearing on its own. Life resurrected from death. Well, today we know that the dung beetles had rolled the dung into the dirt and hidden their eggs in them, and the eggs were made to withstand the flood and sprout once the water was passed. But the Egyptians didn't know that. Probably some priests and educated people did, but um, for the most part, the dung beetle came to, res to symbolize the resurrection of life from nothing. The beetle shared this with the sun coming up in the morning. The sun was several gods as it passed across the sky, and one of the most miraculous gods was the god that sent it up out of the earth, coming from nothing, every day, to be once again miraculously 
grown into life. So, when we look at the ancient Egyptian tombs, we see many, many symbols of the scarab, the scarab being the word uh, that means beetle to them, and the scarab literally does mean the resurrected light. Just as our language has B-E-E-T-L-E -E -E to represent the beetle, the letters of the word scarab literally meant to come into being, or to become, or to transform. So it is not surprising that these people buried their loved ones, the people they cared about and hoped to spend eternity with, with symbols of re resurrected life. The scarabs that they would put with them as they were buried, and the scarabs that they would print on the walls, and the scarabs that they would have as statuary around their temples, all represented the human eternal longing to be forever in life and with our loved ones. I am sure that the resurrection of life was an idea that had been with humans long before the Egyptians. Indeed, it is what the returning of the seasons, what the observation of solstice, and of course, the daily celebration of the coming up of the sun is all about. However, in Egypt, this very advanced phenomenal civilization, the lowly dung beetle, the lowly roller of shit, was the animal, the creature, that kept alive the concept that we have come to know as Christ. A handsome young man had a beautiful girlfriend who, after they'd been dating for a while, said that she would like him to become more affectionate. He loved her and wanted to make her happy, so to make sure he became more affectionate, he went and got a couple more girlfriends. And that's this week's adventure on the Beer Drinker's Guide to the Great Wahoo. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you next week. And remember to keep celebrating the Great Wahoo.